We've just seen that graphing a firm's profit-maximizing decision, when it can vary both labor and capital, involves graphing in three dimensions. It involves graphing where that profit sheet is just tangent to that three-dimensional surface that gets created by the production function. But graphing in three dimensions is going to be hard. Fortunately, there's another way to think about profit maximization that does not involve graphing in three dimensions. And we call that our two-step profit maximization method. This method divides profit maximization into two very natural steps. In the first step, we just think about the firm's costs and we ask, how much does it cost to produce different quantities of the output? In the second step, we then ask, how much output should we produce now that we understand how much it's going to cost to produce different levels of output? So step one then simply focuses on the cost of production. And then step two focuses on how much to produce, given that we understand our costs. And let me illustrate that two-step method in the simplest possible case first. And that simplest possible case is the case where capital is held fixed in the short run. So in the short run, we said firms are going to operate on the short run production function that tells us for any amount of labor, given a fixed level of capital, how much output I can produce. Now to think about costs, I kind of want to reverse what this picture tells me. This picture tells me for any given level of labor, how much can I produce? What I'd really like to ask is for any level of output, how much labor is it going to take? So I want to know how much labor is it going to take for any given level of output to produce that level of output. But all the information to answer that question is already contained in this picture. This picture tells us initially it gets easier and easier to produce. It requires less and less labor to produce additional units of output all the way up to this inflection point. And once we get past that, it gets harder and harder to produce. It requires more and more additional labor to produce additional output. When we invert this picture, when we flip the axes, we invert the shape of this function. So now it's going to look like this. But it tells us exactly the same thing as this picture told us. As we produce additional amount of output, initially it's going to require less and less additional labor. But once we get past the inflection point, as we produce additional levels of output, it's going to start requiring more and more additional labor. So the two shapes tell us exactly the same thing. We've simply inverted this graph. Because doing so now lets us answer the question, how much is it going to cost to produce different levels of the output? In the short run, the labor costs are our only costs. So if we know how much labor it requires to produce different levels of the output, we just have to multiply that by the wage to figure out how much it's going to cost. So the cost of producing X is just equal to the wage times how much labor it's going to take to produce X. So that gives us a function. It gives us a function that we can call a cost function that tells us for any level of output, given whatever the wage is, how much it's going to cost us to produce the output in the short run. And we can graph that function because when we multiply this by w, all we're doing is scaling this function up. We're not changing its shape. We're just scaling it up. And so we're still going to have exactly the same shape for the cost function. As we produce more output, we can now put dollars on this axis because costs are measured in dollars, we're going to get a shape like this. So that's our cost function.
for some given level of the wage. It tells us how much it's going to cost to produce each level of output in the short run. And it again tells us exactly the same thing as this original function did. Initially, my costs are going to rise at a slower and slower rate as I produce more output. But once I get past this inflection point, my costs are going to rise at a faster and faster rate. That's because initially it gets easier and easier to produce, but eventually it gets harder and harder to produce as I produce more. So now we've answered that first question. What's the cost of production? But we can derive from this one more curve that's going to be useful. And that's what we call the marginal cost. So the marginal cost we're going to denote by MC. And the marginal cost is just the additional cost from producing one more unit. So if I'm currently producing, say, this much, then I can ask, how much is my total cost going to rise if I produce one more unit? But that's just going to be answered by the slope at that point. The slope at that point tells me, roughly, if I increase output by one unit, how much costs are going to increase. And we know what the slope of a function is. It's just the derivative. So this marginal cost is just equal to the derivative of the cost function div with respect to x. It's just the slope of this function. So we can graph that again with dollars on the vertical axis. We see that the slope starts very steep. So initially, the marginal cost is high. But then the slope becomes shallower and shallower all the way up to that inflection point. So that means the slope is decreasing. The marginal cost is falling until it reaches its bottom at the inflection point and then the slope is rising again it's getting steeper and steeper so the marginal cost is rising so the marginal cost then is u-shaped and it's u-shaped precisely because the short run production function has this shape it initially gets easy and easy to produce which means the additional cost i incur from producing more is initially falling and eventually it's going to rise because eventually it gets harder and harder to produce on this part of the production function. So that then is the marginal cost of producing additional units of output. And this we can use to go to step two. In step two we're going to ask how much should we produce? Now so far we haven't had to think about the output price at all because so far all we've thought about is the costs of the firm. But now, when we think about how much to produce, we have to think about revenues. So we have to think about what price can we sell the output for. So suppose that the price that we can sell the output for is up here. We would then say, well, that price gives me the marginal revenue, the additional revenue I get from producing one more unit, because I can sell it at that price. My marginal revenue is larger than my marginal costs for that first unit. I'm making more than it would cost me. So I should go ahead and produce that first unit. And similarly, the second unit is going to raise more in revenue than it's going to cost me, because I can sell that second unit for that price as well, if I'm a price-taking firm. And that's going to keep being true all the way up to here. Once I get to here, if I produce one more unit, the additional cost is going to be larger than the additional revenue, and I'm not going to want to produce those additional goods. But all the way up to this point, I keep making profit for each unit that I'm producing. So I should go ahead and produce this quantity if the price is at this level. What if the price falls to this level? Well, now I'm going to lose money on the first unit that I produce. It's actually increasing my costs by more than the revenue I can collect for that first unit. And the same is going to be true for the second unit and for the third unit all the way up to here. So I'm actually making negative profit on those initial units. But then I get to make positive profit on all the units up to this quantity. The additional revenue I get is larger than the additional cost I incur. So all that area becomes positive profit. As long as that area is bigger than this area in here, we're still making profit. We should still go ahead and produce where the marginal cost curve tells us to produce. But eventually, price is going to fall sufficiently low so that 
this negative area is exactly equal is exactly equal to the positive area these initial losses are exactly equal to these later gains well at that point we've reached what we've called the break-even price if the price falls below the break-even price we know that we're not going to want to produce it all so we are going to supply nothing but once we hit the break-even price the marginal cost curve tells us how much to produce and so we've just traced out the firm's short-run supply curve and it looks exactly the same way as it did when we derived that supply curve directly by doing one stop one step profit maximization We've just now split it into two steps. In the first step, we came up with the cost of production that allowed us to derive the marginal cost curve. And in the second step, we said the firm should produce where price is equal to marginal cost as long as the price is above the break-even price to give us our supply curve. 